Okay, I'll call the Morad Public Housing Agency's regular meeting to order. Uh, August 25th is the date. This is done over video again, modified process due to COVID-19. The Morad Public Housing Agency meeting will be held as a video conference at 11.30 a.m. on August 25th, 2020 due to COVID-19. The public may not attend in person. Recording of the meeting will be posted on the City of Moorhead webpage following the meeting. There is time reserved on the agenda for citizens to be heard. Any citizens to be heard can address the board by calling 218-299-5463. Uh, I'm Greg Lemke, the chair, and if the other uh, board members would like to introduce themselves. Alexa Dixon, Greg, secretary. Is that Heider a member? Okay. And the executive director of Public Housing, and we also have Tony Bondal, our housing manager, in the room. Here. Don, I don't know if it's just me, but you were very hard. You're very hard to hear, so I don't know. I was thinking the same. Hold on, just a minute. I'll change our setting. I think I know what it is. Okay. Okay, how about okay. better? I can hear you better. Yep, yep, that's yep, better. That's Sorry better. about that. I um got it. some new technology, which means I have to sometimes it resets on the wrong setting. So sure. Okay, okay. So the order's been uh roll call's been taken. Uh, are there any agenda amendments? I have no amendments. Any citizens to be heard at this time? Any calls? No calls at this time. Okay, so our first item is the approval of minutes. So um, I'll entertain a motion to rec um, approve the board, the minutes from the July 28th board meeting. I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. <clears throat> I think you're muted as that and you, you, if you're, you and Alexa are the only two, you'll probably have to do the Motion and second. I, I second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second. <clears throat> any any issues with the minutes? Any questions, concerns? Okay. Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The next item is the request approval for payment of bills. Okay, and I just want to double check. Can you see the screen <clears throat> I'm sharing? It I think it went black for a minute there. Yep, but it yep. should be back up now. Sorry about yes. that. Yep, it is. I think I <clears throat> moved away from it when I was resetting something. So thank you, Chris, for sending me that message about it. Chris is our e IT person that's just on the line. Payment of bills, um, nothing unusual in terms of checks that were processed over the last month. Um, the only thing that would be noteworthy is good news. And that is that we did finally close on our um, POHP loan with the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency, um, and that was an end loan. So we paid out the expenses and then had to close on the loan and get reimbursed for those payouts. So we did receive that $58,000 um, to reimburse us for the costs incurred for the elevator modernization at Sharpview. Is there any questions for Don about the um, bills for the month? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I will move to approve the bills. Second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to approve the bills. Any further comments, questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. The next item is the summary of the executive session that we held. And I need to read that, I guess. So bear with me. I'll get it pulled up here on a larger screen so I can see. Okay, so this is the summary provided um, at the August 25th board meeting. The Mort Public Housing Agency conducted a review of its executive director, Don Bacon, in the executive session on July 28th, 2020. The purpose of this of the executive session was to give feedback to the director on her performance over the last year and set goals for the next review period. The summary of the executive director's review review are, are as follows. The performance feedback covered the rating period of July 12th, 2019 to July 11, 2020. The executive director provided a report highlighting accomplishments during the reporting period. The board provided feedback on the following related to the executive director's performance, strengths that contribute to effectiveness and aspects that require improvement to, not, to increase effectiveness. Collective comments of the board indicate that the executive director is meeting or exceeding performance expectations. Specifically, the board felt she's very dedicated to the mission, the Mord Public Housing Authority, to the staff and to the residents. She has a strong work ethic and is constantly seeking ways to improve the agency. She has excellent communication skills and ensures the board is updated regularly. She's very knowledgeable and keeps abreast of the issues facing public housing nationally and locally. She demonstrates effective financial and legal management skills. Based upon the results of her performance evaluation, Ms. Bacon will receive a salary adjustment per the conditions set forth in the board's employment agreement with Don Bacon. The next performance evaluation will cover the rating period of July 12, 2020 to July 11, 2021. And the next performance review session will occur in July, 2021. So we do have a motion to approve that executive summary. So I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion. Sorry. Okay. I make a motion to approve the, the executive summary. I second. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any further questions, comments? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> Next item under business is the strategic plan progress report and next steps. Okay, so I know this has been a while in the making. Um, given our situation with COVID, um, we had to kind of focus more on essential board meeting items and now we're able to expand that a little bit more. Um, so I wanted to give a full update and report to the board on um, the progress that we've made with our strategic plan, as well as what I'm proposing as um, benchmarks for the coming quarter. So I put together this PowerPoint to just summarize um, how we put our strategic plan together, what our priorities are, the accomplishments that we've made thus far, and um, what goals we're setting over the next quarter. Um, and the board, obviously, I want your input on um, any reflections on accomplishments, but more importantly, um, any ideas you have for benchmarks going forward, um, we can certainly modify that plan um, and ask for your approval on that. So just a recap on the process um, that we used, um, we conducted surveys with residents, staff, and community collaborators to get feedback about Moorhead Public Housing and our services. We received um, a total of 46 response responses, which was a good response rate. Um, 26 from collaborating organizations, um, four different staff responded, as well as 16 of our residents. Back in October of 2019, um, we did a full day facilitated session, and you probably remember that we had um, Part of the day with um, Moorhead Public Housing Agency staff, board members, and key partners. Um, and then we broke into um, a more focused session um, at the end of the day to finalize our priorities. The board formally approved um, or adopted our strategic plan and priorities um, in December of 2019. 
And at that meeting in December, we also talked about a process for checking in going forward whereby um, we would check in on a quarterly basis on um, both the achievements as well as what benchmarks we wanna set going forward. Obviously, you're all familiar with our mission, vision, and values. We did um, go through a process a year earlier prior to the strategic plan to identify our agency values of respect, integrity, commitment, safety, and diversity. And with our strategic planning process, we did just revisit our mission, vision, and values and just reaffirmed um, those as guiding our work with the strategic plan. In the strategic planning process, um, these were some things that came out um, where, in terms of longer term vision, where we wanna see ourselves in five years. And then we identified six agency priorities, which are listed on the screen. And you can see that the last two tie into each other. So as I report out on those, you'll see there's a fair amount of overlap in terms of um, our work to end homelessness, as well as um, partnerships and work around housing stability. In addition, I will say there is some overlap with the other priorities as well, um, which is a common, you know, dynamic with with the work that we're doing so to start um, maintenance improvements and energy efficiencies that was a big area um, overall we talked about um, having safe buildings um, having a really strong connection between um, how our maintenance work impacts um, our resident well-being and and kind of longer term goals and really having those more integrated um, having a sense of ownership for our properties um, and just being really proactive and planful in terms of preventative maintenance and also really looking at um, energy efficiencies. So on the left side col column, you can see that we have um, a fair number of accomplishments um, since we started out on this path. So we're really happy to report that we've made some progress with LED conversion um, we've started some new practices um, like um, having meet up, meetups with lease up meetings with people um, at the scattered site locations so that while we um, meet with them, we can talk with them about like how to replace their furnace filter and, and do some more in person hands on work. Um, some of these things have been changed a little bit due to the COVID 19 pandemic, um, but we are really keeping track of what those practices are so that. Um, we can resume um, like those in-person meetings as soon as it is safe to do so as a best practice. We took a lot of measures to prevent boiler freeze-ups. Um, we made those safety changes. Um, one of our, our ladders on the sharp view roof, um, it was kind of grandfathered in. Um, and so it met the regulation, but we wanted to go above and beyond um, in terms of um, worker safety. And so we did make some improvements to the ladder. And then of course the elevator modernization, which you're well aware of. Proposed third quarter benchmarks are listed there. Um, taking a look at our process for, um, oh, I'm sorry, I should start at the top. Um, this, this top one will be on hold because of um, some of the issues related to COVID, but we would like to do some more networking. I do a lot of networking with other agencies um, to hear kind of what they're doing, what we're doing and compare best practices, but we'd like to see more of that happening with our maintenance department specifically. Um, so there may be some work that can be done over the phone or indirectly, but we'd like to see some more in-person work um, when it's safe to do so. Um, extending some vents at Sharp View to prevent freezing in a sewer smell. I know that's been an issue. Our air handler unit replacement at the high rise is underway as I speak. Um, hopefully while I'm talking, you won't hear any jackhammers in the background. I should say that is a, that is a possibility. <laughs> and then um, we'll be reviewing our protocols and process for inventory, just to make sure that that is as, as strong as it can be. Um, and then we're also looking at some energy efficiencies with our closed loop system that's connected to our air handler unit. So those are the proposed third quarter benchmarks in the area of maintenance. Any questions on that first priority? 
or anything that you want to suggest? Just a question on the <coughs> venting at sharp. Uh, raising the vents, um, the idea is that the venting will draft better. But I seem to recall there was also some discussion about um, some of the vents actually leaking due to thin walls and so on being um, uh, cast iron vents that had deteriorated. Is is there also discussion on on lining some of those vents or replacing those or what is or is simply getting them to draft better um, is the idea that that will be adequate? Right. Good question and good recall, Michael. Um, it's kind of two different things. The one on here has to do with the roof where when we get snow, um, we found that the snow covers up those those vents. And so that kind of backs up the system. So that's something we want to tackle. But in addition to that, and I think um, with your input, I can modify this plan a little bit to reflect there's ongoing work being done in the building about replacing um, piping that's problematic. Um, we don't have a plan at this point to do a full scale replacement. So it's kind of gradual and where we see issues, but I think it would be good to reflect that work in our in our plan. Okay. So I'm just making a note of that. It's nice to see all the accomplishments really. I mean, it just it, during this time with COVID and stuff, when we're not out and about as much and meeting and seeing each other, you kind of think everything's on hold, but it's good to see that you know, people are still working on, on the things that they can during this time period. So it's much appreciated. Thank you. I'll definitely um, communicate that onto our staff because there has been a lot of work that the agency has had to um, attend to related to the COVID-19 <coughs> pandemic. Um, but we've definitely been doing everything else on top of that and, and really have some significant accomplishments across all of our priorities. So that is definitely something to take pride in. I should add too, I forgot to note that we replaced the carpet at the high rise and that was that's significant and one that actually was noted in our survey process with residents, they mm -hmm. talked about the carpet and it really did need to be updated. So that was another accomplishment. Mm -hmm. Very good. Public housing repositioning was another um, priority and we've made significant gains um, in this area. And I think the board is fairly well briefed on this because I know it's been a big area. So I don't know that I'll go through every one, but we got our consultant on board. We've done a number of presentations with the board. We have reviewed all of our repositioning options and identified what we believe is the best option for the 30 units that are the scattered site units. Um, and we have a plan underway that the board um, recently approved to do a more formal review of that specific option. And there's a lot of work, you know, underway with that. Any questions or additions for public housing repositioning? I have a, I have a, sorry, I have just like a, a comment. I mean, to, to what extent do we communicate with our, let's say that, you know, the, our, let's say clients, the people who are in, in, in the housing units for, for taking, like, you know, for taking these decisions. Do we, involve, do we involve them in, in, a, in a way or another to see like, you know, sometimes when we listen, we find more like issues and concerns popping up and that you said, you know, if it's done in this way, it will be better. Or if it's done, done in that way, it would be better. Sorry. Yes, thank you for that question. And, and that is a really important point. Um, and we have. Um, in the last year, we've sent a number of mailings and, and included this topic in all of our resident meetings. Um, and then now as we move into this more formal review, we have a more um, intensive resident consultation process underway. Um, 
One thing that we've done is created a video that is up on our website. So if any of you just go to our web page, which is on the um, City of Moorhead's website, and if you just Google Moorhead Public Housing, you'll hit on it um, very easily. But you'll see there's a PowerPoint video with Tony and I talking that goes through what is happening with repositioning. And it also invites people um, to a couple of meetings. Um, in addition to that, we've sent mailings out um, to all the residents um, with a brochure that we developed with our consultant, um, highlighting that video and in asking them, we can't mandate it, but highly encouraging them um, to attend two in-person as well as virtual meetings. Um, we've created both options. Um, you know, with COVID, it's safer to meet virtually, but we also have to balance that with some of the barriers that uh, uh, internet-based meeting could create for people. And so we also offered it in person with additional precautions in place. Our first meeting was yesterday. Um, we only had one resident attend, uh, but he had some really great questions and, and we were able to you know, provide that information to him. We have another meeting next week on September 2nd. Um, in addition to that, we have had an interpreters on hand with the most common languages that people speak. Um, so that that way, you know, we're asking that people request an interpreter, but if they don't do that and we find that they need interpreters, we're more equipped um, to be able to communicate just as clearly as possible with residents. Um, thus far, the number one thing that people want to know is, am I going to have to move as a result of this change? And the answer is no. There's nothing about um, this change that will require people to move. However, um, people will have additional options um, if they do, if they're eligible for a Section 8 um, voucher, they will have additional options to move if they choose to, and they really like that feature. So we've also gotten feedback um, that people do appreciate that added flexibility that if they find themselves in a situation where they need to relocate to another community or they need to move for whatever reason, um, they can bring a subsidy with them, whereas under our current public housing program, they don't have that option. So good questions. The next um, priority was pursuing new funding and financing resources. And I know we've had a lot of discussion about long-term sustainability. Um, the need as an agency to be looking to other sources of funding and other programs outside um, specifically the public housing program. Um, so some accomplishments, um, the low-income housing tax credit program is definitely one that we're looking at and um, I've obtained training and certification on that program. We completed the physical needs assessment for the Maple Court townhomes, which we are looking at um, as kind of a strategic opportunity um, where we can preserve affordable housing and also get our feet wet with low income housing tax credit in that extended use timeframe, which is a really good first step to get familiar with that program. And then um, we also did access some um, options for community development block grant funding. And that was just, um, that plan was just approved by the city council um, last night. Um, and so when funding is available, um, it does depend on income coming in to the CDBG um, plan. But when they do have funding available, we are built into their plan um, to get some funding to pay for some um, um, sprinkler system improvements with our buildings. So that will be good. And then you can see the third quarter benchmarks. Um, Tony Bondel, our housing manager, is currently going through the low-income housing tax credit training and certification process. Um, we're still underway in our going through the financial and feasibility analysis for Maple Court to determine um, if we do want to purchase that property. And I'm just keeping it on my radar. I would like to apply for a grant through HUD um, for safety and security funding um, to either look at, you know, like a weekend security guard making the rounds at the high rise um, or adding some cameras into our elevators and some other 
spot. Um, it's there's no way to know when that grant will be available. It comes and goes periodically. So it is something that we're watching that I think we could make good use of. Um, and then we also are working with the city of Moorhead and we're approved um, to access some coronavirus coronavirus relief funding. Um, and right now we're looking at replacing the rooftop exhaust fans at Sharpview. Um, so that's good news as well. So Don, those, those relief funds from the city, what can they be used for? What's the parameters on that? The parameters, they have to be necessary um, in order to respond to COVID-19. And I do have access um, also to some operating fund dollars from the CARES Act, mm. and those are more flexible. Okay. Um, the CRF funding um, that went to counties and cities have more restrictions. Mm. And so I am currently um, still, you know, providing some information to city staff so that we have very clear rationale as to how it mitigates you know, the impact of COVID-19. And looking specifically at the exhaust fans, um, that's a pretty clear cut thing because sure. It, sure. It, it will incur, um, ensure that there's um, good fresh air mm -hmm. circulating throughout the building. Whereas right now our exhaust fans are a little bit old. They were identified in our physical needs assessment as moderate wear. Um, and they are approaching their expected useful life. And so having new ones installed will certainly help with um, reducing the likelihood of transmission. Okay. So Don, two questions. Um, one on the exhaust fan replacement. Um, would that increase the volume of air that would be exchanged? I don't think so. Um, I think what it would do is ensure that the, our system is working in an optimal fashion. Mm -hmm. so um, it would just these, it would address the reliability, basically. Right. These fans have broken down in the past because they're old, mm -hmm. and so I I don't know that we're ne necessarily taking things to the a next level or a higher level. I think it's more maintaining. Mm -hmm but making sure we have a reliable, like you said, effective system in place. Okay, and then my second question um, backs up a little bit to the HUD safety and security grant. You, you kind of indicated that that grant was available on an intermittent basis. If, if that grant became available or opened up and we were successful in securing that grant, is the renewal also intermittent or is that once you get in, then is the renewal process an ongoing thing? Oh, yes, because, um, yeah, different grants are so different in terms of how they structure that. For this one, it's more of a periodically and intermittently, HUD will put this out. You apply specifically for one project. That project is funded and then it's done. And then you wait for them to put it out again. So by being selected, it doesn't close you off or it doesn't um, create, it doesn't change any future opportunities, whether you're selected or not. It's really at um, one, one step at a time. So we would, the potential would exist that we could be funded for whatever the grant period is, and then the grant may go away. That's correct. The grant is more of a project based um, grant. So it's not like, oh, you're funded for the next year to to do anything that comes up around safety and security issues. It doesn't work that way. It's more you make your pitch about what you need related to safety and security. You tell them how much money you need for that particular work item. And then if you're funded, you're funded for that work item. And you probably have, I don't know how much time, but they would give you a time frame to get that work done. Okay, I, I guess what, I, what I'm thinking, and maybe I'm not making myself quite clear, but you had indicated possibly a security guard for weekends. So if we received funding to, to, to pay 
for a security guard for weekends and we got a year or say two years worth of funding after two years that funding goes away it, there's not a guaranteed renewal process for that funding um we so we may get two years worth of a security guard with no with no renewal process that's correct yeah. Okay. So if we did look into that, and again, I haven't applied for this grant before, so I don't know all the ins and outs, but we would have to be clear about the length and time period of the of the grant so that we could um, put that in sync with any contract that we would enter into with the company um, so that the resources from the grant, you know, would connect and then we wouldn't have those resources once they're done. Right. I'm always uncomfortable with funding personnel with non renewable grants. Right. And this would not be um, personnel that we would hire internally. What I would be looking for is um, Contract. contracting. Right. Okay. Thank you. Is, yeah. I, I have a, a like a kind of suggestion. I don't know whether it's, it would be a good or not for that security guard contracting. Would it, would it be possible, like, if, you know, we're looking at the, you know, uh, the, the lower income people. So would it be possible that we could, you know, instead of hiring one person, you know, involve some of those individual or families in the process? You know, I mean, like some hours, I mean, like you guys talking about like something in the future. But again, like, could we make it like as a kind of like, like some hours for some of those families, like an individual to be, you know, let's say family, like individual one from this, you know, apartment will be in charge this weekend of, you know, to check the security of the building and that person or that family will be paid like five, seven hours instead of, and then changing to another family. And, you know, in that situation, it's, 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 it's for them and from them instead of like looking at it as a, as a position. Yes, and I do think anytime we're looking at hiring, it is important given our mission to think about, is there a way to extend this opportunity to people um, with barriers to employment? Um, however, in this particular scenario, I would have some reservations about going down that road. Um, number one, um, just bringing on a paid person and a direct hire, it has a number of um, considerations, you know, related to funding ending and having to lay someone off and then paying unemployment insurance, as well as like workers' compensation and, and those kinds of liabilities that you take on when you employ someone directly um, versus contract for that service. Um, and then my other probably more pressing concern would just be the nature of the work with someone in the role of security guard also being a resident um, and just some of the challenges that we could foresee with that and them understanding um, that, you know, what are the boundaries of that role um, and, you know, getting into kind of neighbor conflicts and relationships. Um, I would have some reservations about being able to convey what your role and responsibility is as a security guard when you're working with your neighbor um, and a person overstepping that role um, and doing something that is outside of that role. And then, of course, if we are directly hiring them, that also increases our liability as an, as an employer. So for this particular example, um, that would be my th those would be my concerns um, for this specific need. It, so yeah, I, I I I agree with you. But you know the idea is like not from the same building. You know we have more than one building. We could you know invite a person from building A to building B. And the idea if, if I, I I still remember when we were doing a project for the you know for photoing what's 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 a home for for you. And we could even like not paying them, but a kind of like cut from their rent or it's just an idea. I just, you know, I don't know how it comes. <laughs> so, but it's just an idea to put it over. 
I like the thought. I like that you're, you're thinking of things like that. I think that's awesome. And maybe for other things down the road, I guess I would agree with Don. It would be a lot of liability that would be taken on as well as training. Um, who would, who, how would you train the person who would pay to train them and with limited funds that would just be another thing that we'd have to consider. I will say that we is that we did have a um, lawn care position that opened up this year um, on a part time basis and you know we opened it up very competitively and we did hire one of our residents um, mm -hmm. for that position so we did look to. Um, that base, knowing that many of our residents are looking for work and in need of, of work and benefit from work so. I think to the extent that we can do that, but in the security guard, there are some, I think, unique challenges. The next, if there's no further discussion on the new funding and finance resources, the next priority was the increasing in um, diverse partnerships. Um, and I think if you recall, for those of you who are here when we put together the strategic plan, one of the things we talked about is just being known in the community. Um, and I know I've talked with other housing authorities about this, that housing authorities um, sometimes aren't known as well as we should be known. And so just making sure to reach out across our community and um, and partnering and, and um, collaborating as much as possible. So I noted some accomplishments. Um, is that having you on this board is, is definitely an accomplishment, um, bringing you in. Um, we attended an intergovernmental retreat where we were able to um, interface with different elected officials locally. Um, our gardening, our garden is bringing in neighbors, neighbors that live in the, in the neighborhood around the high rise. And so we regularly see them. And of course the what home means to me poster competition, which we're really excited about, um, has created some new opportunities to talk to people about what we do. So the third quarter benchmarks that we identified um, were to continue to use the materials we have from the poster competition to help share our mission with others. Um, and we also do need to recruit a resident commissioner. Um, we had Rita on board, but she wasn't able to um, serve due to um, a job opportunity that came up. Um, so that's something we'll continue to work on. Any questions or comments on this strategy? Our ending homelessness strategy, I will say, really overlaps a lot with the next one. So I think I'll do both of them together. Um, so, so just... Is that you, you weren't, we couldn't hear you if you asked. Okay, sorry, sorry for that. But the partner, you know, the idea of the partner. What extent do we deal with the, the housing in 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 Dewars and in Fargo? And that's one. The the other question is the partnership. Is it possible to make more partnerships for you know for like for the idea of build of, of buying like more more buildings and stuff like that? But I, you know because of working in the community, I there's pieces i see that there's a big load and when you're talking about the new american or with my new like a color community it's 70 percent of them are in more and because of the you know because of the minnesota's programs and stuff like that and so the idea is can we you know you know help like like try to, I don't know how to put it, but anyway, make more like partnership or build for buying more building or building more buildings, and the idea of uh, 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 you know the apartments or or or, or townhomes that's good for like for big for big families also. Right. Um. So just. 
to start with, um, you asked about um, Clay County HRA and Dilworth as, as well as Fargo Housing. Um, and we do have um, good partnerships with both of those agencies. Um, I would say Clay County HRA, probably a closer partnership just by nature of them being in Minnesota and us both being connected to our statewide um, narrow um, um, group, which is like a networking training group. Um, Clay County HRA and Moorhead Public Housing actually have a joint on-call emergency response system. Um, so our maintenance staff know each other and they back each other up um, on a regular basis. And then we're working very closely with Clay County HRA on our repositioning goals and actually had um, one of the Clay County HRA staff in our resident meeting yesterday, um, working very closely together so that if we do um, transition those units um, to the Section 8 program, you know, Moorhead Public Housing would become the landlord, Clay County HRA would administer the housing choice voucher, and that we're working very, very closely together to make that as seamless and as smooth as possible for our residents. Um, we also just partner a lot with Clay County HRA in talking about housing needs in the community and how to coordinate those efforts um, as effectively as possible. Um, so that's really strong. And in Fargo Housing, of course, we communicate them with them on a fairly regular basis. But you know, given the difference in size of our agencies too, um, I, I know that we do um, more regularly talk with Clay County HRA. Um, in terms of, I think you asked about like the new American communities and, and communities of color um, and the housing needs there. I, I will note there are some very particular disparities around homelessness um, when looking at communities of color. And so we are doing work um, in like when we're a part of the West Central Continuum of Care Homeless to House Task Force, um, as well as a member of the Fargo-Moorhead um, coalition to end homelessness. There's a lot of discussion and work underway around equity um, and how we can um, provide services and, and supports in a way that's equitable and really in, in mindful of the fact that we do have racial and ethnic disparities in our community around homelessness and housing in general. Um, in terms of building more buildings and offering more affordable housing, that is absolutely what we hear time and time again. I hear it from all of you and the board when we talk about what we need to be working on. I hear it from the community all the time. It is a difficult, challenging issue. Um, and the more time I spend in the housing realm, the more I understand that, you know, this, there's this huge need for affordable housing, but meeting that need um, is significant in terms of figuring out the funding. Um, and so we are taking steps, I think, through the work that we're doing with um, becoming more familiar with the low income housing tax credit program um, and looking at potentially acquiring the Maple Court townhome so that we can preserve that affordable housing. But that's definitely the direction we need to be moving in. It's just, it's not something that can happen as quickly as I'd like to see. And I know as quickly as others would like to see um, given the resource you know, constraints that we're under. And I do think we need to keep in mind is that you and I talked about when we met for coffee about larger households um, and we do see that need. Um, so whether it be Moorhead Public Housing or when we're working across um, different constituencies and talking about affordable housing, I think we need to keep in mind that there are larger households um, that are having a hard time finding housing due to you know, what's available. Um, so those are kind of some initial thoughts to your comments, but certainly welcome any board discussion on this topic. I see Azat, you just commented, thank you, Don, in the, in the comments. Um, do any other board members or? Well, else? something um, that I have been dealing with here in my neighborhood is, uh, this is Shelly, sorry. Um, it's a 12 unit with people on assistance across from Taco Bell. And I did door knock within the neighborhood because the only thing that's keeping them um, going from 12 units to six units with mixed use is because they'd have to rezone and the neighborhood is against that. But what would happen is everyone that was 
in that apartment would be moved out because then it would become, and I asked how much would uh, rent be? And it would be a studio apartment for a thousand dollars a month, which is not affordable. And we are, you know, like you were saying, looking for homes with uh, more bedrooms. And um, so it's a continuous fight to keep the affordable housing we have. And then I have, you know, discussions with people saying, but yes, we need, we need developers to come in and, and do this, you know, business. And it's like, the argument I have is if you have people on assistance, that's a guaranteed income. Whereas if you're going to change to these, these more expensive apartments, how many, how many people do we have? Where are, the Moorhead median income is 34,000, which means half make less, half make more. And, and, it's it's just like nationwide that we have uh, a shortage of affordable housing. So it's it's in like an ongoing battle. I mean, you have to keep on top of it constantly, and 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 to educate people on why we need to have affordable housing, which is like I said, guaranteed, paid. Whereas if we you put a business in, especially at this time, you know you're not going to have renters for that. Um, and that, and so it's even fighting within the city where they, they want to have businesses, mixed use, and um, people that live in the neighborhood are saying, no, we don't want that because that's going to bring businesses onto 7th Street. It's supposed to be only on 8th Street businesses that if you change that apartment to mixed use, it creeps into the neighborhood, right? I mean, so it's a constant struggle, constant struggle to keep uh, affordable housing around. You know, and if you look at all the, the the newer apartments that they've put up downtown and what they all want to do is the mixed use on the bottom and very expensive condos. And and it, so it's not. I'm, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, but I mean, it's not just what we have to deal with, but I mean, what happens within the neighborhood and keeping on top of it. Um, and something else I wanted to make sure that um, I, Michael. Um, and he may already know this, but the the CARES money from the city, if if you guys um, with with the small businesses apply for that money, um, it's on the city of Moorhead website and um, it's not first come first served. They're actually going through all the applicants and, and seeing um, they want to make sure people that are veterans, women, minorities, you know, the different categories. Um, where they're going to grant the the CARES money to. Um, so I just want to make sure, if, and if you know anyone, I mean, type daycare, any kind of small business, everyone that should apply, any minority. So anyone that you know, please have them apply for that money. Um, it's on the city website. Um, and I guess that, that, that was it. <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that everyone... Um, that knows someone that's got a small business applies for this because there's a better chance with this money than there was with the Fed money. Because they're actually going through and it's not just whoever applies first. So, but yeah, everyone's everyone's fighting for the same cause, you know, the affordable housing. So. Yeah, Shelly, your comments really um, highlight just how many partners are involved in this process and that we have to be mindful that Moorhead Public Housing as an agency will have to keep asking, like, what is the right thing for Moorhead Public Housing to do? And what is the right thing for us to collaborate on? And those might be two different things, depending on what we're looking at. Um, I know that what you said about preserving housing and, and expanding housing, that there is a tension there and that a lot of the work that we're focused on right now is to preserve what we have, like the work with the repositioning our scattered sites absolutely is focused on being able to preserve those options um, so that we have a sustainable funding platform that allows us to preserve those affordable housing options for the long term. Um, and then also, how do we partner with other agencies? Like, you know, we um, provided a letter of support to Minnesota Housing Finance Agency and Churches United's application for the Silver Linings development. Um, so just working in concert too with other agencies and understanding what kinds of new housing they're developing and, and how we can support that effort too. So it's a lot, it's a lot, and there's a lot of people involved. Yeah, to kind of address that from the developer and owner perspective, 
developing affordable housing is much more expensive than just developing housing on a on a per unit basis. The federal requirements uh, are quite stringent and, and add quite a bit to to the cost just in terms of your uh, of your your environmental assessments and so on. There's generally anywhere from seven to ten layers of funding uh, are required, and that that makes it quite difficult. And then your your ownership requirements as as you own the property for a twenty or thirty year period, you know, what, dep depending on what your federal funding is, um, it, quite, most owners are quite eager to get out at the end of that period and and convert to um, regular ownership, you know, to where they can get regular rents, market rate rents for that and, and get out of the federal subsidy. And part of the solution is to simplify the process and streamline the process of, of developing and owning low income housing. Um, I, I saw that with my brief board tenure at at Beyond Shelter, but even in my involvement with the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Um, and so it's, you know, if you have to have federal subsidies to develop low income housing because the market won't support developing housing for people of low income or people with special needs. And then the federal requirements to get that money are so stringent and so complex, so complicated that it makes it a bit of a, a nightmare and a challenge to, to negotiate all that. The, the, the cost per unit is, is quite high. And so there's got to be a solution to that. And it's a, it's a legislative solution is, is what it is. And, and, and it's a, it's also a, a regulatory solution within the bureaucracy. And those who sit on boards like we do um, are really challenged to address those things. But at some point, we, we kind of have to look at that as well. And I don't know if you've spent a lot of time thinking about that, Don, but that's, I, I know you've spent some time bumping your head up against those challenges but part of the solution is is addressing the underlying problem itself and do you have thoughts on that don well i appreciate just your insight into that because i think we often look at well we need to do this we have to figure out a way but getting underneath it and understanding why does it have to be this way you know what are some of the ways that it could be designed differently that would make us more successful. So, um, yeah, I think it's a good reminder to be in conversation with our elected officials and be looking at process as much as we're looking at our goals is what is the process connected to meeting that goal? Um, and how can that be set up in a way that where we're gonna be more successful? So this ending homelessness tie, you can see our, our involvement with the West Central Continuum of Care, but there's a lot focused around stability and, and resident wellness. Um, we have started um, measuring data um, for housing stability. Um, we had a living well with diabetes class with residents. Um, we've been reaching out to different agencies, um, specifically looking at the issue of addiction and recovery. Um, so we have, um, met with the Lotus Center as well as recently with Red River Recovery. We had a remote virtual meeting with their staff and our staff. Um, COVID preventatives is a big issue with resident wellness right now. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. Um, we did add some additional lighting to our parking lot at Riverview Heights. Um, and sorry for the acronyms, the Hasami grant kickoff with CAP LP. That's a lot of acronyms, but that's, <laughs> that's a specific grant, um, that CAP LP was able to obtain. We did a letter of support and have been collaborating with them on that, where it was expanded. And it's about housing supports for people with, um, mental health, 
or mental experiencing mental illness. And so just, I think it's our focus on doing work internally as an organization, but also being very proactive to reach out with other organizations when they have new grant initiatives um, to set up time to really talk through with them, how can we work with each other um, so that the residents that, that we're serving can benefit um, from these kinds of services and supports. I, I have a comment on that, uh, Don. Yes. So besides that, that inviting the other agencies to deal with these kinds of issues, like let's say, like, you know, the, the addiction, the mental issues and stuff like that. What, what, like, what other steps have we taken? Like, like, you know, is there, is it possible like that we could do some environment change that could also promote for, you know, uh, uh, for motivating people to, you know, towards the, 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 other, the other positive side instead of those like addiction and stuff. Because, you know, what I'm trying to say is sometimes the environment also direct people towards, you know, so the idea is like, you know, having, you know, a gym or, you know, like having like a, a, some some nice photos in the hall and, you know, those kinds, the, the, I think those also may may help like you know for like making more education for people i i think i'm following what you're talking about i wholeheartedly agree that we really need to take a more holistic look at how this is done and the kinds of messaging and the types of environment that we promote for our residents i think the garden is a good example um, of something that we've done environmentally that promotes resident wellness promotes resident staying in recovery because it gives them an opportunity to socialize with other people um, and it creates just a healthy you know environment um, certainly we have work to do around um, like signage in our building and 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 just different things that are visual cues um, and i think we've also though been intentional about how we interact with residents respect being our top core value i think that promotes people who are in recovery staying in recovery or even having our Ross service coordinator um, using really good practices with people that are trauma informed um, and meeting people where they're at. Um, people are more likely um, when they're, they feel more empowered and more respected and listened to, they're more likely to seek and um, be successful with their recovery. So I think that's what you're getting at. And, and, and that may be something that we need to give more thought to about um, in terms of third quarter benchmarks, if there's something else that we need to um, specifically target, and I see is that you're writing in the comments, right? So I I must be following where you're where you're going with that. So that's a really insightful um, area to be focused on. So third quarter benchmarks, um, you know, this is in my ED updates, but I could probably cover it now. It just came out the notice of funding availability. For, from HUD for the Ross coordinator grant re renewal. And that's a really big deal. And kind of to our earlier conversation, Michael, that you know grants are all different. The Ross grant is a three-year grant, and then you have to apply for renewal. Um, you do get some priority um, in terms of the competition. You're more, more or less competing with other renewal applications. And then if HUD has additional funds left over, they look to new applications. So that is to our benefit. Um, but that application is due November 19th. And so our Ross coordinator and myself are currently going through that 58 page NOFA and working on preparing a really strong application. Um, we've had tremendous success with our Ross grant program. Um, it's really served residents well um, and has really brought us forward a lot in this priority area. And so we definitely need to keep that grant strong um, with Moorhead Public Housing. We are also researching some options for Wi-Fi access for residents, and I hope to bring you some more specifics on that um, in the next month or two. At this early stage, we're really in a preliminary point of gathering information. We're surveying residents. I'm talking with an internet provider. Um, I'm not sure if I'll really have a feasible plan that is cost effective for us or not, 
But I think part of what we talked with our facilitator, Bruce Miles, about as we were putting together the strategic plan is sometimes your next step is just gathering all the information you can um, about something before ruling it out. So that's what we're, we're doing in that area. And we do have um, um, a training session scheduled for our office staff to learn about the new Medicaid housing stability services that are coming online with, within the state of Minnesota. Um, so that we're really equipped to help people connect with those services. And then finally, I just wanted to share some posters with you in this PowerPoint because that's what it's all about. And I think it really um, puts it all into perspective. So this is, of course, the poster you're most familiar with, this, the one that won statewide. Um, but here's some other posters that we received as part of our competition. And this statement is um, another um, resident who submitted um, a poster had this statement about what mo what home means to him. So I dare you to read it without maybe tearing up. So it's just a really neat statement. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of my presentation on our strategic plan. And I did make several notes um, from the comments and feedback I got from the board so I can make a few modifications, but I, I am proposing if, if you're comfortable adopting it um, at this point, um, the board could pass a resolution to adopt it or I can bring back, you know, the modified plan next month. Thanks. Thanks again, Don, for I think it's great to see the accomplishments there. Thanks to you and the staff for doing that. And then the, the benchmarks or the goals are pretty ambitious, but nice to see. So what's the wishes of the board? Do you want to approve what we have, what Don has presented? I'm, I'm comfortable approving what we have. And so I will make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay, motion and a second. Further discussion, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. We've got a few items under other business, Don? Yes, I will try to be brief and concise. I already talked about the Rocks grant renewal, so you have that information. Um, fiscal year end budget performance. I was hoping to share with you um, financial statements for our fiscal year end June 30th, 2020. Um, we're still making some modifications, closing out the fiscal year and going into the next one. Um, so I didn't feel like it had enough accurate information for the board to share um, at this point. So it's still in draft form with our fee accountant. Um, what I will tell you in terms of budget performance uh, um, is similar to what I've been reporting throughout the last several months, which is um, while we passed a balanced budget, unfortunately, we will end that last fiscal year at a deficit. Um, and, you know, we were successful with controlling expenses. Um, my projection is that we came in about $7,500 short of our, our budget for budgeted expenses. So we didn't overspend. Um, so it's more of a revenue problem. Um, and so we budgeted um, a little too high on both rent revenue and our HUD operating subsidy. And I know I've shared details about that with you in the past. So once we have our year end information, I'll get that out to you. Um, on the on the bright side, we did get the Clay County HRA transfer of public housing through and approved. And um, Greg and I are finalizing some paperwork um, for that funding to actually hit our bank account. Um, and so with that transfer, the budget that the board passed for this current new fiscal year, which started July 1, we will have a surplus of about $63,000. So that will um, more than cover um, the deficit that we experienced in the last fiscal year. Finally, I would also add that we are in a healthy place in terms of our, our reserves. Um, HUD recently shared information with all PHAs that put us at about six to seven months worth of reserves. And that's a very strong position to be in. Um, of course, we do have, when you go out much further longer term, we have concerns about longer term sustainability issues. 
um, and not having you know, enough funding, but we're taking a lot of steps to address that. Um, and so in the meantime, we, we have adequate reserves. Um, so that's just a kind of a brief report of fiscal year end. We do have our audit scheduled for late October for the um, fiscal year end 2020. Repositioning update, I really would just, I talked about the resident consultation is that you had asked about that. So we've been doing a lot of work on that. We have um, attorneys working with us to develop a LLC. Um, I'm calling it the Moorhead Affordable Housing LLC. Still waiting to see if that um, name has been taken by another entity, but we're in the process of establishing that. Um, and then also doing some legal work on the property side. Again, all preparing for the application to HUD, which we anticipate going forward probably in November. Um, and prior to that, we would need city council approval. And so I'm working with the acting city manager, Dan Molly, on bringing something forward to city council late September into October. I don't have a specific date yet. So a lot of work underway on repositioning. Those are my updates for today. All right. Thanks. A lot of information. Anybody have any last questions about any of those updates, comments? Uh, just a comment. Um, based upon our position financially when I joined the board and where we're at now, I would congratulate John on Dawn on her good fiscal management. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I second that immensely. Yeah, it's it's awesome to see that turnaround. It's great. All right, no attorneys reports. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody, and take care. Thank Bye you. Bye. 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 Bye.